Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, with the understanding that a couple more people might join us um, slightly later on. So, um, just to get started, um, my name is Emma, and uh, I'll be one of our co-facilitators today, along with my colleague Alex. So we'll introduce ourselves shortly. A couple of housekeeping notes, just as we get started. Um, uh, just a couple of notes. So first, to keep your audio and video on mute, just in order to prevent feedback throughout the session, and to please use the chat window for your questions. So we have a number of wonderful moderators supporting us today who will flag any questions for our attention so that we can have a discussion. Uh, and the other point is that the session is currently being recorded uh, for use with future resources. So I'll speak more to those shortly as well. But those resources will be a part of the online teaching program and will be housed in a wiki through CTLT. Um, and so what we will do is take portions of our slides and of our video today uh, and make those available online for you as well as our slides. So thank you so much for joining us on this Monday morning. Uh, and we'll go ahead and get started. Looks like we're good to get going. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. I'll briefly introduce myself again. Um, so yeah, my name is Emma. I'm the Learning Commons Coordinator in the Irving K. Barber Learning Center. Um, I've got a background in curriculum design and higher education, and a lot of my role involves overseeing a number of WorkLearn students who uh, develop and deliver academic support resources and services for students across UBC, both online and in person. So. I'm going to be facilitating along with my colleague, Alex Kuskowski. Uh, and for those who are just joining us, I'm located currently in East Vancouver on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Squamish, Musqueam, and Salish nations. Um, so the majority of my work at UBC Vancouver takes place on unceded Musqueam territory. Um, so we believe it's especially important to uh, reflect on and to articulate the indigenous territories uh, that we're located on, especially now that we're all in uh, different spaces working online. So considering how to understand and articulate the territories that we're located on uh, while we're working in various digital spaces. Uh, and Alex, I'll let you introduce yourself now. Hi everyone, I am the Learning Services Librarian. Uh, my focus is on first and second year student learning and engagement through the library. And my work includes co-supervising the student team at the Chapman Learning Commons with Emma, as well as overseeing the de development of first year student learning engagement, uh, especially online for the library. So really thinking about how we can connect. I am a settler woman joining from the West End in Vancouver on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, and I use she, her, and her, hers pronouns. Thank you, Alex. Uh, and you'll see that our moderators, Carissa and Janie, have linked a couple of really excellent resources. So if you haven't already, I'd encourage you to take a moment just to introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, and if you're aware of whose traditional territory you're participating from, to acknowledge that in your introduction. So in order to do that, you could refer both to uh, the link that Carissa has shared called nativeland.ca, um, as well as the um, CAUT resource, uh, which is a guide on acknowledging First Peoples traditional territories. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, lastly, if you're interested in learning more about Indigenous sovereignty and the ways that that translates into online spaces, you can refer to the final resource that's linked here called Decolonizing the Digital. Um, and as you uh, wrap yourself around those introductions, um, we're going to uh, very briefly introduce our facilitators. All right, yes, yeah, so while Emma and I will be your talking heads this morning, there's a fantastic group of, a group of folks working behind the scenes. Everyone on this list has contributed to the resources you will see here with their area of expertise. I would especially like to highlight uh, David Gardner on this list for his contributions as he co-facilitated the first round of this presentation, and Janie as well for her co-facilitation of both presentations. We really appreciate all the work that's gone into this. 
All right. So we have a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we want to let everyone know the session is being recorded and portions will be archived and available online. Uh, we are anonymizing some of the content from the discussion and the chat to be used in developing post-session materials. We also want to acknowledge that everyone has varying bandwidth, uh, which we'll dig into further in the session, but uh, connecting however you can. Uh, and then we also want to remind everyone to please mute when you're not talking to avoid background noise and let our moderators and, and hosts know. Um, and if you ha are having issues, we have the ability to mute and unmute all participants if you forget these instructions. And uh, lastly, please make sure to use uh, emoticons in the chat box. Uh, if you're so inclined, please pick your favorite emoticon uh, <laughs> so we know that uh, you are engaging with us today. Right now, feel free to pick your favorite one. Uh, and please type in your uh, questions and uh, concerns in the text chat, which will be responded to by our moderators as quickly as we can and passed along uh, to MRI if we can answer a question for the whole group. Uh, we will also uh, share the registration confirmation form, which I believe was shared a little bit earlier. Please fill it out if you haven't um, to confirm that you are attending this session and it will be provided uh, in the chat by C the CTLT events team. This will allow us to share the session and resources afterwards and an online feedback survey. Lastly, I just want to touch on the fact that we are trying to model best practices here today. So uh, we're using Collaborate Ultra because of privacy and bandwidth. Uh, we're not screen sharing uh, other things. Other, We will be uploading slides and sharing links in the chat uh, so that we have less margin for error and crashing as we've already seen this morning. Uh, so hopefully everybody will get all the resources that we'll be sharing as well. Uh, other, th other than Emma and myself, no, will be, no one will be using cameras and microphones to preserve privacy and bandwidth. Uh, and lastly, uh, we will be hosting all of these materials and the discussion boards on campus uh, for asynchronous learning. I'm going to hand it over to Emma. Great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so since, um, oops, one slide too much. Uh, so, since this is a session about supporting bandwidth in the online learning environments, I wanted to also briefly touch on what we're doing uh, from our end in order to support and as well as to model these practices of online learning that we hope will support your bandwidth as you engage in this session. So, as uh, Alex mentioned, we'll be making digestible portions of this session available to you. Um, as well as sharing our slides from today on an open wiki module as part of the online teaching program or uh, OTP uh, through CTLT. So we've been working to make session materials both from this round as well as from the previous round of the session uh, available in an open wiki page uh, through which we also hope to build community in an ongoing manner by giving you a space to connect about these resources as well as your experiences with teaching. So. Um, moderators, if I could ask you to link uh, the wiki module in the chat. Thank you so much, Janie. Um, and we'll be working uh, together also to build out um, an ongoing resource from here of our own experiences and recommendations for supporting student bandwidth in the online learning environment. So uh, that will all be accessible in the wiki page and we'll share this again at the end of the session just to make sure that you've got that um, at hand. So in terms of the learning outcomes of our session, I'll uh, briefly review these now. I'm hoping that uh, by the end of the session, we'll be able to increase awareness of the impacts that the rapid transition to online learning is having, both on instructors and on students. I'm hoping that we'll decrease the stress on bandwidth, which we'll define in more depth shortly for both students and instructors. That will illustrate minimal computing entry points, um, and by minimal computing, I mean both literally and metaphorically, uh, to online learning that are less stressful, um, and you know, in order to encourage us and allow us to learn better and to balance that with living uh, lives more holistically. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll. Um, you know, acknowledge that learning and living are coupled together quite closely right now. And so throughout this session, we really encourage you to think about uh, taking the perspective of the whole learner, as well as the whole teacher or instructor uh, coming into any sort of teaching and learning context. So 
we first developed and presented this workshop in reaction to the overwhelming nature and, you know, in some cases, panic <laughs> associated with that rapid transition to learning online. So now that we've had a few months to settle in a bit and to reflect on our experiences, we've shifted our resource to develop them more proactively uh, rather than just reactively um, and very immediately in that situation. So I'm hoping that we can hold that space in the session to reflect and to build higher quality resources together. Um, so this session will be framed more around what we've learned since uh, that first iteration. We've reflected on the guiding principles document for fall 2020 course adaptations, uh, which I recommend you all to refer to um, and which I might ask the moderator to post in the chat. Uh, so a few of the guiding principles within this document uh, recommend approaching course adaptation decisions with a commitment to compassion and care for everyone involved, um, accommodating that reality that access to technology will likely vary quite greatly uh, across students within your courses, and exploring ways to adapt course design in order to take advantage of the flexibility made possible by online learning in order to cultivate a strong and inclusive online learning community. And so when I refer to uh, proactive approach rather than reactive um, what we mean is taking all these considerations into mind so the learning outcomes you see on this slide are our original ones and we hope to be able to iterate and reorient ourselves to these with more of a sense of longevity as well as the possibility of sharing our learning uh, collectively moving forward We've also had plenty of time to collect feedback from students about the transition to learning online um, and what instructors can do to make things better for students. So uh, Alex and I will make sure that we're touching on this feedback throughout. So in addition to the quantitative student connectivity survey released by the university, Alex and I, like we mentioned, work very closely with a number of students who have shared their qualitative stories and recommendations based on their own personal experiences. So together, we hope that all of this um, and our ability to rely on the research and the feedback that has been given can give us a strong rationale for the importance of this work to have at the top of our mind uh, when designing courses. All right, so uh, here's our agenda. You'll notice we've already done the first one. So we're part of the way through already today. <laughs> uh, next, we'll be talking about bandwidth, defining what it means, why it's important both for you and for your students. Then to build on that, we'll move on to considering how we've adjusted so far and exploring strategy, strategies where we can improve bandwidth for everyone. And this is building again on the previous session uh, where we touched on these things, but we're moving on uh, further in this session. Lastly, we'll round out this presentation by recommending some resources and answering any questions that you might have. So let's get to it. So bandwidth. We are using the term bandwidth as a double metaphor. First, we're using it to describe the data and information uh, that data is transmitted over a fixed amount of time. So usually expressed in bits per second or BPS, or also known as bytes per second. Uh, and that data transferred to students. So thinking about uh, information transferred through video chats and online lectures. Secondly, we'll be using the term bandwidth to capture the higher cognitive load for online learning for both students and instructors. How much can be transferred and how much can be absorbed? These are gonna be the questions we're going to be asking today. In both cases, bandwidth is a finite resource. You can only take in so much data and you can only take in so much information. Many students uh, access course materials through their phones, via shared internet connection, or on older machines that cannot handle this heavyweight technology uh, that we're currently repurposing. So teaching with student bandwidth in mind usually doesn't hurt anyone, and to the contrary can benefit everyone, including the instructor, particularly when we get to grading. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But keep in mind that attention to both types of student bandwidth should always be a consideration. The online context makes it more significant. And the global pandemic, uh, when everyone's under more stress, even now, um, can bring both types of bandwidth to the forefront. So uh, keep that in mind, because there's a tendency to overcompensate with technology or course design when shifting a program or learning online. Be mindful that bandwidth can help you to focus on the fundamentals of your course. So really thinking about 
focusing on what connections you want to make uh, and making sure everyone can access it through that technology. Thanks, Alex. Um, and so in thinking of bandwidth as the cognitive load of online learning for uh, students as well as for instructors, I wanted to touch on the concept of bandwidth tax. So we've adapted this slide in the previous slide from the work of Ben Chung, Jennifer Doyle, and Hanai Sukada, who spoke at the most recent UBC First Year Educators uh, Symposium about their research on supporting Indigenous students' bandwidth and student well-being with a particular focus on belonging. So loss of students' cognitive bandwidth, uh, they found, occurs with scarcity and insecurity related to aspects such as health, uh, safety, finances, sense of belonging in the academy, sense of respect, and more. So these are called uh, limiting factors, which um, impact a student's ability to access complete brain capacity uh, in order to effectively engage in learning. So if we think about this in relation to the online learning environment in particular, limited technological bandwidth or access to technology could also impact a student's cognitive bandwidth or ability to um, fully engage with their learning. So in the following slides, we'll be sharing more about students' personal experiences of bandwidth loss, uh, and we'll also be talking about how to mitigate uh, or prevent bandwidth loss. So what you see here is the results from a Mentimeter survey that we conducted the first time we did this workshop. So uh, one thing to note is that these numbers probably won't add up as folks responded to multiple categories and because we've only included the most common categories here. But these results indicate challenges that were commonly experienced by the 42 um, session participants last time. So acknowledging the fact that learning and living are very closely intertwined right now, I wanted to preface how our current context for learning could incite situations that impact not only students, but also instructors' bandwidth. For example, with sudden changes to things like your finances, uh, your health or illness, family or parenting responsibilities, um, of course, since generally your kids wouldn't come into work every day, uh, your housing situation, travel plans, uh, your physical location in the world right now, uh, your support system, and of course, a significant interruption to all of our routine and social life in some manner over the past months. So, um, what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to start with an activity which will eventually carry throughout the course of this session. What we have is we've created a Google Doc um, which I'll ask our moderators to share in the chat now. And um, I'd like to ask you to take just a minute to populate the first column by sharing some challenges that you've had with the transition to online learning uh, as well as the remote working environment. Uh, so I'll just give you a couple minutes to access that Google Doc. Please let our moderators know if you're having trouble accessing it for some reason. And one thing I wanted to note as you do that is that uh, Google Docs, uh, while we're using it as a tool today, has privacy implications for student information. So we're using this uh, tool for instructors and staff within the context of the staff workshop. Uh, but if you're choosing to use this uh, with your students, which can be a very useful tool for collective brainstorming, you might want to ask your students to consent to use uh, and and as well as you want, might want to reiterate for them um, that they don't need to share personal and identifying information. So, um, you know, there's a language that you can uh, find available in the CTLT site that uh, can reframe this for your students in terms of opting in and out to using a tool like this. Another thing to acknowledge is that um, this tool doesn't necessarily work in China. So thinking about that uh, if you're choosing to use uh, Google Docs with your students. And of course, there are alternatives that are um, maybe not as easy to facilitate as Google Docs, but have more privacy. For example, the potential of creating a wiki page uh, or a, a Canvas discussion board. Whoever wrote that their kids haven't had childcare, I know that that's a very significant issue uh, with even folks that Alex and I are working with as well, um, as well as the fact that school in September is, seems to be a very nebulous thing right now. Lots of things up in the air with that. Disruption to schedule in terms of attending classes at nighttime and their time zone, for sure. And then you know this is something that impacts both students uh, and yourselves, I'm sure, <laughs> with some classes having moved to the evenings in order to accommodate alternative time zones. I can definitely identify with finding space to work in a tiny apartment, whoever wrote that. <laughs> <It's kind of laughs> difficult. Chloe, yes. Yeah, I can definitely relate. So we'll give you folks just another minute to work on that. Um, and I think uh, as we do so, uh, Alex, uh, feel free to touch on this next slide. <laughs> 
So while we're considering all of these impacts and changes, uh, you know, I encourage you to consider that if you're dealing with these impacts, so are your students. All of these contextual factors from finding space to childcare to uh, working with a frontline worker are um, contextual factors that are pre-pedagogical considerations in an online learning environment. So in order to teach effectively, it's important to consider students' unique needs in this context and to respond by shaping your pedagogy accordingly. So I'd like everyone, while they're either suggesting or listening, to take a minute to consider how aware are you of the context surrounding your students' learning and what else they are currently juggling? So you don't need to know the specifics of each of your students' complex lives. Uh, I probably couldn't keep track of you know, mine. So um, just make sure that uh, in order to be aware, attentive, and responsive to their human context, to consider that while you're creating your um, online content and your um, informational content. Your goal as an educator in this new environment is to give them the tools and the agency that empower them to take learning into their own hands. And that's what we'll be talking more about today. So we've all taken on various emotional and contextual stressors. These pre-pedagogical considerations are important to keep in mind when designing and delivering learning materials. So, you know, an example of that is you could design an excellent learning experience, but your learners need to be able to access it. So the most useful way of delivering course information for students at this time may be different how it was the most useful in your in-person course. So with that in mind, we're going to jump to an activity, another activity. Um, so considering what sorts of challenges your students are experiencing right now, or the challenges your students have shared with you previously, take a few minutes to note those on the Google Doc, and we'll go from there. So uh, maybe we'll have the moderators or we can click that Google Doc that we shared earlier or reshare it. Um, it's the second column in the Google Doc. So we filled out that first column, and I see folks are already starting to put in uh, things in the second column. So naming challenges that your students are experiencing so that as we go forward in designing our learning activities, uh, we're aware of the concerns that they might have. Uh, and again, I want to highlight that the uh, takeaway here is that we don't need to know every specific thing. This is just kind of getting an idea of what might uh, come up. Lack of access to technology and limited internet usage, as well as getting access to print collections and resources, those are certainly um, things that are really prevalent, at least with um, people who I've worked with, for sure. Yeah. I noticed someone put poor internet connection for rural students. I would yeah. say you know, students everywhere can have or internet connection. It just depends on, you know, what kind of internet connection, who else is using the internet connection, and what kind of speed you're paying for. Uh, it can be difficult for lots of folks there. So I think that's a really great notation. Yeah, for sure. Immigration issues as well, ha leaving, having left Canada very, very rapidly, uh, potentially in March, and uh, in many cases not being allowed back in. Um, I was just about to add, but it looks like uh, you're already adding that this might affect employment opportunities. Uh, there are definitely significant hurdles in terms of that as well when it comes to um, immigration as well as uh, students finding work uh, to support their studies throughout university. So thank you for highlighting that. The other one I thought that I liked was struggle to learn the tools. I know that uh, there's a perception that uh, students, especially younger students, are uh, digital natives in every way, but uh, they, like us, are struggling to learn these same tools, and it takes time and uh, cognitive load to be able to access all of those things. Absolutely. All right. 
Well, thank you very much for contributing these. Um, just in interest of time, we'll move on. Uh, again, the takeaway here is that we don't need to know every specific thing our students are facing, but just being attentive to these realities can help us to shape our pedagogy in order to support uh, students' bandwidth accordingly. So, um, Adding to what you've described within this Google Doc, I wanted to share a few stories in the words of our students who have shared their words for the Learning Commons student blog. So uh, I'll read a few quotes in order to shift into a discussion of strategies and resources in order to help address these challenges. But, um, you know, and we share this uh, information in order to encourage you to further reflect on whether your own students have shared stories with you. Um, and again, just wanting to foster awareness of the complexity of students' lives, uh, as well as acknowledging that our goal is to teach towards this complexity. So um, before uh, these qualitative stories, I'll start by referring to the Transition to Remote Teaching Survey, uh, which I linked, or which I mentioned, sorry, at the beginning of our session, in which I'll ask our moderators to link. Thank you very much, Chloe, for doing that. Um, so 576 students from 11 faculties and uh, throughout various year levels uh, responded to this initial survey um, of the transition to remote teaching and learning uh, and students' general well-being. So a few key findings from the survey um, are as follows. First is that almost 75% of students responded that they were unable to focus on their studies due to non-academic related challenges such as the ones that you've described in the Google Doc. Students experienced a general lack of focus due to stress, uncertainty, low motivation, and personal circumstance, which of course is uh, no surprise, at least to me, I know that we are going through the same thing. Uh, and uh, students perceived a mix of asynchronous and synchronous learning to be the most beneficial. So this is something that we'll share a little bit more about later on. Uh, and again, if it's difficult for you to view uh, the screenshot that I've captured that's up on our slide, you're more than welcome to refer to the survey later on. I think it's a really excellent resource just to sort of uh, get a general framing or understanding of students' experiences um, last term. Uh, and of course, like I mentioned, I also wanted to briefly share some qualitative data. So these uh, students are um, two students that Alex and I have worked with um, who, uh, as you can see, have quite different perceptions of their online learning environments. So one uh, actually has quite a positive perception uh, saying that I find it much easier to articulate myself on a Canvas discussion board when there aren't 50 other eyes on me. Uh, also, the virtual space provides a sense of anon anonymity when it comes to asking questions on Collaborate Ultra. Uh, so I thought that that was really interesting feedback in thinking of um, teaching towards the complexity of our uh, students' online learning environment and thinking of it as a sense of potential or possibility uh, rather than solely the challenges which students are facing. But of course, um, alternately, this uh, student on the right-hand side didn't enjoy the online learning environment, saying that it was missing the human interaction element. So they say that it became harder to concentrate on the lecture uh, with a lot more distractions present in sight, which again is an experience that, um, at least from what I've heard from the students I've worked with, is quite common. So, uh, of course, in framing our online uh, teaching practices, it's important to consider ways um, or to explore different ways in which we could provide opportunities for both of these students to thrive within the same or similar online learning environment. Uh, and lastly, this student speaks to caretaking responsibility and concern for their loved ones, which I'm sure many of us share. So uh, saying that it's been indeed difficult to take care of myself and my family. Uh, the student has both of their parents living in Vancouver, which of course is great, but at the same time scary. Their dad still works and interacts with people because of his job. Um, and of course, they don't want to think what would happen if uh, he got sick. So this uh, student says, my worrying is intensified knowing that both of my parents may also be at risk. And I hope that everyone can keep the safety of our friends and family in mind so that we can work towards building a safer community. And so of course, concerns which are external to uh, their online learning can definitely have a significant impact on a student's ability to uh, engage in their learning uh, in the online environment. So now we'll shift into strategies to mitigate some of these challenges when designing uh, online learning. Yeah, to reiterate what Helen's, or <laughs> uh, Emma said, we've talked about uh, our experiences and our student experiences within the lens of bandwidth. So 
uh, we'll talk about how to mitigate it and respond to it in our learning context. Generally, we think of asynchronous learning as low bandwidth. Synchronous lectures, particularly with screen sharing, require large amounts of data, but are also high stress on machines and internet and data plans. They require a lot of cognitive bandwidth insofar as students, likely with multiple other obligations, must log in at a specific time and devote attention in a uh, distracted environment. However, uh, we want to note that there are benefits to synchronous. Uh, lectures and, and synchronous activities. Uh, David Gartner, students, uh, you'll remember he uh, helped present this session in the first round, uh, reported a sense of normalcy afforded by synchronous sessions and a feeling of community when he surveyed them. Students in the UBC survey that we shared earlier echoed this and added that it can help with accountability and time management. However, there are also benefits to asynchronous lectures and learning activities. Uh, they use low bandwidth and lack technology, um, which meets the needs and limitations of many different students. They're available on demand and invite multiple levels of engagement, including email, discussion posts, watching audio and video on their own time, even uh, graphics and visuals which allow for folks to engage with the content from different time zones, perhaps different in internet connectivity um, levels, and give greater flexibility. So how you balance your asynchronous and synchronous content should be done in terms of the cost benefits analysis with bandwidth as a measuring stick. What is essential about being present in a synchronous lesson uh, or environment and situation? for your class, and how does it integrally connect to your course or learning objectives? So asking questions like, is synchronicity essential? And if not, is there an asynchronous alternative? So here, uh, I want to refer everyone to David Gartner's excellent resource on gentle pedagogies, which I'm hoping our uh, moderators might be able to share in the chat now. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, and he created this in the context of COVID-19. Uh, so in this document, he has resources that he's put into practice with his classes, including examples of how you can help empathize and be more accessible in an online teaching environment. By accessible, we mean low bandwidth lectures, assignments, and discussions that teach towards the challenges that students are currently facing. He also put an emphasis on asynchronous learning and community building. He has drawn heavily on the disabled ingenuity that is provided for accessible online teaching far before COVID-19. So some of the examples I really want to highlight here include chunking about how you can break your lectures down into smaller bite-sized pieces. So for instance, in five-minute blocks, offering shared note-taking as an option for students, or having asynchronous discussions. So giving that opportunity for learning to happen outside the space of the physical or synchronous class. You can also organize Google Docs into text-based breakout rooms and have students report back on those learning activities. And there's also much more, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that link. Thanks, Alex. So, um, so yeah, like Janie mentioned, of course, you're more than welcome to ask any questions about the presentation in the chat. So uh, what we kind of have right now is a final Google Doc activity before we move into sharing some resources and tools that we've compiled, both for instructors as well as some student-facing resources. So uh, in light of the concepts that we've shared, we're hoping that you could reflect uh, and share the following, um, and perhaps one of our moderators could again link our Google Doc in the chat. So um, we've got two questions here. First, uh, to consider things that you could incorporate in your classes in order to help mitigate the challenges we've discussed. 
Um, and then second, do you have any recommended resources that you've used so far in your courses? So um, our hope, of course, is that this document can serve as a collective resource, given the experiences that we've had so far with the transition to online teaching and learning. And of course, we want to draw on your own experiences and your kind of collective, um, collective experiences uh, in creating a resource that we can um, all draw on and share with each other. So uh, thinking of um, you know, things that you may want to incorporate in order to mitigate all the challenges that we've listed. Uh, so maybe something that you haven't tried yet uh, pertaining to synchronous or asynchronous learning. And then second, uh, whether you've drawn on any resources so far that you would like to recommend or share with others, especially knowing that um, some of you may have experienced that really quick transition back in March and have had some time now to reflect more proactively on uh, an approach that you might want to consider moving forward. So feel free to head over there. Uh, we'll give you a solid amount of time to do so, maybe five minutes, 10 at the very most. And of course, in the meantime, if you have any questions, please feel free to post those for us in the chat. Uh, and Alex and I will address those while we work on this Google Doc together. So I'll comment on a couple of these as they come up. Um, I think it's great to provide students with very clear outlines of how each week will run, including lectures, deliverables, uh, and what is expected so that students can plan ahead. I think that this is especially relevant when it comes to uh, students managing you know, additional responsibilities in terms of work, in terms of childcare or family responsibilities, uh, and all of those additional things that lead them to have to juggle their personal responsibilities with their family responsibilities. Um, Sorry, Alex, go ahead. Oh, the other one I saw that I quite liked was breaking longer sessions into multiple shorter sessions and activities. That's something that I've also employed for learning sessions that I've been designing. So looking at having uh, those short five minute videos and maybe a couple of questions that uh, students can engage with outside of that synchronous lecture time, which is really fantastic. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of virtual coffee time, <laughs> you're saying that you're not sure they would use this. Uh, we definitely have found mixed um, mixed uptake in terms of uh, students being um, students wanting to do something like this. But I think that uh, it would certainly be um, a really excellent thing to try, just in terms of providing that informal connection with students. So, uh, you know, especially with first year students or incoming students, I think that they can sometimes perceive a barrier between themselves and their instructors. And so I think that um, any sort of low stakes opportunity for interaction like this one that you've suggested would certainly be really beneficial. Um, and I think that's something that can sort of, you know, be a plus side to the online learning environment is that students are uh, maybe having, you know, a better understanding that their instructors are humans as well with, you know, personal lives and that are also juggling many of the similar things that they are. And so I definitely think that uh, giving this informal time to connect with students is a really excellent idea. Uh, and same with games and engaging activities. Alex and I like to spend part of our meeting time with our students doing things like icebreakers. Uh, and uh, we think that it's really beneficial for our students just to have a, an opportunity to sort of relax and do something fun um, and connect with each other, knowing that uh, it can be a little bit more difficult to find that space to connect with someone uh, when you're not sitting side by side with them, uh, for example, in a classroom. So that's a great idea too. Yeah, one uh, resource I just popped in to the list of recommended resources is Kahoot, which is a gamification of getting students uh, feedback and involvement. So uh, you can ask questions, students answer, and then, um, you know, little animations pop up and there are winners and that sort of thing. So uh, that can be a really fun way to incorporate that gamification piece into your synchronous lectures if you choose to. Mm -hmm. I also like these other resources that have been put in here. Um, the compilation of resources for low and no bandwidth teaching is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, in terms of courses having a lot of group work, um, I think it's really excellent that you're giving this a lot of consideration in terms of the logistical challenges related to that. Um, definitely I've heard that forming groups based on time zones could be um, a good way to mitigate it. Uh, as well as um, building in, if there is a synchronous component to your lectures, building in group work time um, 
perhaps even at the very end. I've heard of TAs, for example, sticking around at the end of the synchronous portion of a lecture uh, and using the same uh, Collaborate Ultra Room or wherever you're hosting your course and your synchronous component uh, to immediately form breakout rooms after the formalized portion of the lecture has concluded, uh, just so that students don't necessarily have to work around planning um, different times that work for them outside of that. So uh, just another option that could work for some. I also want to highlight that uh, Janie said in the chat that she's worked with an instructor who groups students around their time zones and it worked seemed to work for them. So that's a helpful uh, resource Ooh. as well. Oh, and uh, sharing a time zone tool in Canvas. So that's really awesome. That's awesome. I hadn't heard of that. Uh, start, uh, there's a question also in the chat around lack of motivation in students. Um, any thoughts about mm -hmm. this, Alex and Emma? That's a really great question. Thank you for sharing that. Um, in terms of the work that we have done with our students, um, it might be a little bit different for us because we're, you know, uh, working with students who are in a work learn program currently. And so technically it's their job. But um, a couple of things that we do to sort of promote motivation in our students, uh, we have a number of check ins that happen periodically, um, both synchronously and asynchronously. So, you know, um, maybe this is something that would be possible if you're working uh, with students in a smaller class context, especially. But what we ask our students uh, is that we get them to submit a weekly. Uh, remote work sort of uh, feedback form in which they list the accomplishments that they've made as well as the things that they need to do the following week um, as well as what we can do in order to support them effectively in being able to accomplish those things moving forward and so I think that um, asking them to do this every week gives us a really good uh, kind of baseline on the level of motivation that they have for example you know whether they've been able to complete the same amount of work whether they're feeling stuck with the work that they're doing uh, and you know in turn this really helps us get to the root of what's affecting their motivation so if a student has uh, completed less work that week than the prior week uh, we'll you know kind of check in with them and have a bit of a chat of what's going on um, of course often finding that uh, lower motivation can be a result of these extraneous factors that are happening in students lives so Alex and I are lucky enough to be able to um, make time to work one-on-one -on -one with our students in addressing those concerns um, but I think in a large course context uh, something that I might recommend is uh, if it's possible building time in uh, to synchronous portions of class to give students time to get started on their work knowing that they've already set that time aside um, and I think that uh, even having a system like um, a buddy for accountability or even uh, breaking up outcomes into very small manageable steps, uh, students especially in this environment can become daunted with the idea of a really large uh, project or task that they have ahead of them. And something that we've found in our work with students is that time management is one of the biggest struggles that has come out of uh, the switch to the online learning environment. So I think that uh, being able to give students resources and tools to more effectively chunk their time into small and manageable chunks can uh, help kind of foster intrinsic motivation with students. Um, Alex might have something to add to this, but uh, I would be more than happy to chat a bit further at the end and share some resources that we have uh, regarding time management for students. I would uh, just uh, quickly uh, add that, yes, as Sarjeet says, creating a sense of community in the classroom, I think that that can help as well in terms of motivation if you feel like, if students feel like they can connect with other students for help or um, for discussion, that can help to create um, a better engagement level with students as well. And uh, again, I'd recommend those resources by David Gardner because he does talk about uh, how to create that sense of community in your classroom. And like Emma was saying, chunking up your resources as well, your assignments. Mm. Absolutely. I would say probably the last thing that we do um, with our students is just acknowledging, you know, especially at the beginning of this, acknowledging that they're not always going to be as productive as they were before. Um, I think that being able to sort of explicitly say this to students and, uh, you know, to uh, 
to just sort of acknowledge that things aren't necessarily going to be normal, that they might not always be at that same level of output and performance that they normally would be, can give students the space to be more understanding towards themselves, uh, which I think in turn can help them to foster more intrinsic motivation, as opposed to just feeling like, oh, I have to get this task done, I just have to get this in, uh, which could result in burnout. So yeah, helping to work with them as opposed to, um, and yeah, again, like fostering that sense of support. All right. Well, I think, Emma, in the interest of time, maybe we'll just go over our resources, and then we'll have uh, a little bit of time. Emma and I will stick around uh, to answer any questions you have as well. Perfect. So uh, resources and tools for instructors. This is an overview of resources that we've put together. Uh, Keep Teaching is a website dedicated to helping instructors develop strategies to meet the needs of their courses online uh, and uh, if there are disruptions to on-campus teaching and learning. So it's really helpful both technology and kind of cognitively for planning your lessons. This Online teaching support is a resource which details student perspectives on online learning. So again, those quotes that Emma said, very similar perspectives from our students who have experienced online learning, and they also suggest ways they feel might help to mitigate the bandwidth tax that we've been talking about, and it also offers links to other resources. The CTLT Learning Commons and UBC Library, as well as uh, the Wellbeing module resource on Canvas, um, is available in Canvas Commons. It, you can look it up and import it into your online courses and embed it straight in there. So these are resources that students can use to access on their well-being, as, as well as you know time management, which Emma talked about as well. Uh, so lots of different things there. But uh, feel free to contact us if you'd like download instructions on that Canvas module. Mm -hmm. Lastly, a note on care outlines ways to continue to cultivate an online environment of care and support in an, uh, in an online space. We will also share these resources with you, and it looks like uh, it's been posted in the chat. Thank you to our moderators um, and the resources we've drawn upon. Uh, for ourselves and creating this presentation in our own practice. It can all be found in the wiki, which has been linked in the uh, chat. I can hear a crow in the background. <laughs> um, so in terms of academic resources and tools, uh, which you can share with students, thank you so much to those of you who have contributed really excellent links to uh, well-being related resources, early alert, uh, as well as academic support resources within the Google Doc. I highly encourage all of you to refer to that in an ongoing manner. Um, but a couple of things I wanted to share from our end. So in terms of academic resources, uh, the Chapman Learning Commons provides various online learning uh, specific support services and resources, including our online learners resource guide with links to various resources about things like communicating and collaborating online, transitioning to online learning, um, and adjusting to a, re a remote workspace, including things like balancing uh, online learning with various other responsibilities as a student uh, and things like that. UBC Library provides services including AskAway, so where students can contact and ask questions of library staff um, and get research help. Uh, instructions for how to get remote access via easy proxy to the library so that they can continue to access resources asynchronously. Um, basic online searching through the library, uh, through the library skills tutorials. So this is another really great resource to share with students in, or, uh, in order to orient themselves to how they can access resources in an ongoing manner in the online environment. UBC Distance Learning uh, has a number of guides for students taking distance courses about topics including course participation, communicating online uh, and netiquette, technology policies, uh, and more. So they've been doing this for quite a while, longer than we have. And although, you know, the format of distance courses um, is a little bit more, I, I would say, structured uh, than, you know, the various forms that our courses have taken with this rapid transition, it's still a really great resource to uh, refer to as a rule of thumb because I think a lot of the uh, learning definitely translates, uh, regardless of the nature of the online course. Um, and then, so in terms of uh, general resources, some things that uh, we'll be sharing in our um, 
handout include uh, enrollment services advisors, UBC Counseling Services, AMS Food Bank, uh, the UBC Wellness Center, and the Center for Accessibility. So those are also shared within the document that was linked in the chat, uh, and we encourage you to check those out just in terms of being able to support students' well-being um, from uh, an online learning environment. So just to wrap up, we wanted to thank you very much for your contributions and of course for your interest in supporting student bandwidth. Um, Alex and I will stick around in case you have any questions or want to discuss anything further. Um, but for now, again, I would um, in encourage you all to refer to the uh, wiki document that Janie just linked. Uh, and so that will probably be the easiest way for you to access all the resources that we've shared within the session. Um, and so, of course, these resources will be available for you to access asynchronously in an ongoing way. We encourage you to continue to do so. Um, you'll also be, um, well, Carissa has shared in the chat uh, the uh, feedback survey for CTLT, or you'll be emailed that afterwards, um, So, um, as well as a link to the resources from the session. So again, I encourage you to look at that wiki link or to contact us if you have any more questions. Uh, and thanks so much for attending this morning. We really appreciate you being here.